Greetings, everyone, from the beautiful Ukrainian Institute of America in New York City. Thank you for joining us this evening, and thank you for your patience as we work through some unexpected technical difficulties as we launched this um, webinar. I'm Kathy Nalavaiko, president of the board of the Ukrainian Institute, and I'm honored to be welcoming all of you to today's exciting program, the second installment of our Power of Passion series, a conversation with the Honorable Roman Popoyuk, the first U.S. ambassador to Ukraine under President George H. W. Bush. Ambassador Popoyuk is our second guest in a series of talks with leaders who share their visions for social purpose with our audiences. Roman Popoyuk is a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine from 1992 to 1993. A retired member of the Career Senior Foreign Service, Ambassador Popoyuk brings more than 30 years of experience in the areas of diplomacy, national security, political risk analysis, communication strategy, and energy policy, including serving on the National Security Councils of both Presidents Ronald Reagan and George Bush. He has written about and is frequently interviewed on issues relating to US-Ukraine relations, the situation in Ukraine, and other national security and global relations. He co-authored Privileged and Confidential, The Secret History of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. His writings have been published in the Ukrainian Quarterly, the Foreign Service Journal, Mediterranean Quarterly, and Presidential Studies Quarterly. Ambassador Popoduk is a member of the US-Ukraine Energy Task Force of the U Ukraine 2020 Policy Dialogue, a forum co-sponsored co by the US Embassy in Ukraine aimed at strengthening U.S.-Ukraine relations and Ukraine's integration into Europe. In 2006, he served as an observer of the parliamentary election in Ukraine. He is also a senior advisor to the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council and member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He is also a member of the Ukrainian Institute of America. Um, due to some technical difficulties, um, Ambassador Popoduk will not be joining us by video, but rather um, by telephone. As most of you know, the Ukrainian Institute is dedicated to promoting and preserving the very best of all Ukrainian art and culture globally. As a not-for-profit, our programs are only made possible by the generosity of our members, donors, sponsors, and audiences. Throughout tonight's program, you will have the ability to support the Institute through a donation link in the chat box. If you enjoy today's program, which no doubt you will, I encourage you to support us by making a donation of any size which will help us to continue providing entertaining and thought-provoking programming throughout the year. Special thanks to our season sponsors, the Self-Reliance New York Federal Credit Union, the Chapitsky Family Foundation, and Mr. Charles Pukpirko. And now it's my pleasure to turn the floor over to Ukrainian Institute member, Dr. Alex Mothit, who will be leading the discussion with our guest, Ambassador Popoduk. Alex Mothit is a historian, political scientist, poet, writer, translator, and artist painter. He is a professor of political science at Rutgers University and is a specialist on Ukraine, Russia, and the Soviet Union. We are delighted that he will be leading the conversation with Ambassador Popoduk over the next approximately 45 minutes and look forward to hearing his thoughts on a wide range of topics related to Ukraine. As we move along, please feel free to type any questions you may have into the chat box and we will do our best to address them at the end of the conversation. And now over to you, Professor Mottel. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, it's a little odd to, to, to be speaking to a telephone and to know that the people viewing this, this seminar can actually see me, but not see the honorable ambassador whom they of course came to see, but be that as it may. We will do the best we can. Mr. Ambassador, can you hear me? Alexander, I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear Excellent. me? Yes, I can uh, as well. Uh, okay, so. The technical difficulties, but we'll try to make this work, Alexander. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Um, I, I've just been looking, I've been looking through your curriculum vitae and, and more generally through your resume. And of course, it's very impressive. And I thought that I'd begin the conversation today by beginning at the beginning. It says that you were born in Austria. I take it that was in a displaced persons camp? I, that's right. I was born in Austria in 1950 in a, in a displaced persons camp. And we came to the United States actually in 1950 as well. I was about seven months old. 
And so, uh, you know, your question brings back a lot of fond memories from what my parents relate to me. Obviously, I have no recollection of those of those days. But we came to the States in December of 1950. We settled briefly in, in Iowa. And from there, we moved toward New York. And I grew up in New York City, uh, basically, and considered that my home for many, many years. And still have fond memories of New York and enjoy New York very much. As a matter of fact, uh, we were supposed to be in New York today for this event, unfortunately, uh, given the COVID situation. We've had to do this through technical means. But yes, I was born in Austria uh, in a displaced persons camp, Alexander. And so you moved to New York. And again, I'm just curious, did you live in the Ukrainian neighborhood downtown? Uh, no, we actually lived in Brooklyn. We didn't live in Manhattan. We lived in Brooklyn on what is considered the South Side. I grew up on South 10th Street along the East R- Riverfront there. So and in Williamsburg? We Williamsburg, correct, oh. which is very posh these days, as you can rec- as you could well imagine, uh, with the influx of young people and the you know renovation of the area. But we were members of the of the Holy Ghost Parish, which is in. Um, the north side of uh, Williamsburg, up toward the Greenpoint area. So there was a, there was a scattering of Ukrainian Americans in our neighborhood, but it wasn't a Ukrainian neighborhood as such. Uh, you probably could count on the fingers of one hand the number of Ukrainian families in that particular area, maybe maybe two hands, you know, ten families at most in that general area. But I did spend a lot of time in Manhattan, of course, and I went to college at Hunter College in uh, Manhattan on 68th and Park and spent a lot of time down in the East Village, which, as you well know, is very much packed with the Ukrainians. Right. So so you didn't attend St. George's School, I take it? No, I, I, I did not. I attended Epiphany uh, School, a Roman Catholic school, which was actually across the street from... Mm. Um, a building where we lived in, so it's very convenient for us. And I think St. George didn't open until the early 60s when I was like in 7th or 8th grade. I can't, my memory doesn't serve me right at this stage, so it would have been something that uh, I was well past uh, up in my upper, you know, uh, elementary grades when uh, St. George is open, but I did not attend St. George, that's correct. Okay, so then you went on to Hunter, and what was the, the, the discipline you majored in? I majored in political science with a minor in history. I attended the in the 68th and Park uh, campus of Hunter College because at that time I believe they had, uh, or maybe they didn't have the two campuses. It was 68th because the upper campus in the Bronx eventually became Layman College at that time. I think, you know, I, I'm, you're asking me to recollect like 40 years or so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, you you went on to do your PhD at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, what did you write your dissertation about? I assume it was in political science, right? Right. Uh, it was political science with a focus on international relations, and, um, and then uh, my secondary was comparative politics. I wrote my dissertation on the dissident movement in the Soviet Union, comp- uh, and I looked at the Ukrainian dissident movement and, um, and the Jewish movement and uh, other movements, uh, but a focus on the Ukrainian dissident movement in, uh, in this, the old Soviet Union. Oh, how interesting. Uh, so it was just precisely the time when they were, of course, very much in the news uh, and the oh, various ab- Soviet crackdowns were taking place. Absolutely. It was very much. And so I, I basically looked on the focus of the dissertation was how dissent was an international issue, how the outside community uh, looked upon dissent in the Soviet Union, utilized it or didn't utilize it, and how the dissidents in the Soviet Union reached out to the international community for support. Uh, and, as, and for leverage against the authorities. Uh, so that that was the gist of my uh, dissertation. And I, I assume you didn't go to the Soviet Union to do field work on the dissidents. <laughs> no, did not do that. Did not do that. But as you recall, during that time, there were a number of dissidents that came out of the Soviet Union. I had occasion, you know, to hear them speak in uh, forums uh, and stuff. So uh, I had a lot of good primary sources based on things like that. Of course. I mean, this was the time when the, the whole, whole number of Russians, Ukrainians, and of course, very many Jewish dissidents were coming out. Uh, so, of course, you could do your field work in New York or, or alternatively just travel around. Um, anyway, you then, exactly. served, you, you then served as an adjunct for a brief period and then joined the Foreign Service. Was that your goal from the very start to become a diplomat or was that kind of the plan B? Well, uh, let me just say, first of all, uh, 
talking about, you're bringing back a lot of memories. You know, I did uh, have occasion in the uh, during the course of the research on my dissertation to hear one or two or uh, dissident in the in uh, the Lower East Side. You mentioned Lower East Side. I think I remember hearing one dissident speaker that I formed that I attended. So it was good access, basically, in that respect. But going going on to what your question, specific question is, I had an interest in international affairs. I spent a lot of time discussing politics with my father and my mother, and I got an interest in international affairs. So I was saw myself as undertaking a career in that discipline somehow. And at first I was looking at maybe becoming an academic, and that's what led me to go on for a Ph.D., but then I had an interest in the policy side, obviously, and I went on and uh, took the Foreign Service exam and went on to join the Foreign Service. But uh, as an adjunct, as I was writing my dissertation and still working as a graduate student, I did adjunct work in um, political science as a teacher of both American politics and international politics at Brooklyn College, which is part of the CUNY system. Right, right. Uh, so you joined the Foreign Service, I believe it was in 1981, and you were, I believe the first posting was in Mexico City. That's right. I had a posting in Mexico City, right? I joined in September of 81, I think it was, if I remember correctly. Uh, did my, uh, what we call A100, which is the introductory course for all new Foreign Service officers. Did that course and then took some uh, Spanish language training. And then we were off to Mexico City, where I spent a little short of two years in Mexico uh, doing consular work. And I also had occasion to work in the front office for uh, the late Ambassador Gavin, John Gavin, the former actor, was an ambassador at the time and had the pleasure and the honor of working for him in his front office and got to know him uh, pretty well. Uh, in, uh, uh, we continue our contacts after, after you know, we separated. He went on and I went on in my career. He recently passed away about oh, three years ago, I think it was. But uh, that, that's basically, yeah, I started in Mexico City. What was that like? What were your relations, your personal relations with the local communities, with the Mexicans? Did you have those? Were those required? Or did most of the diplomats essentially live in American enclaves? Uh, well, you know, my responsibilities basically were consular. All uh, young foreign service officers and young in terms of career, I should say, uh, are expected to do consular work. So I wound up doing consular work for a good part of the first few months that I was in uh, Mexico City. And then there was occasion uh, to need some, that they needed someone in the political section. And so I was pulled into the political section because my cone, you know, in the Foreign Service, you're, d you're divided by cones in terms of specialties. My specialty was po political cone. So I was pulled into the political section. I wound up doing a lot of the opposition party research and following the opposition parties, which at that time also included the uh, the Soviet uh, diplomats and also I had occasion to uh, deal with them quite a bit and uh, follow their tracks in Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. Because as you probably well know, uh, Mexico was a key outpost for the former Soviet Union in terms of trying to get information about the United States. So, you know, the, the Soviets must obviously knew that you were of Ukrainian background. Uh, were there ever any attempts to recruit you or to blackmail you in some fashion? Oh, no, 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 no. They, they were well aware, you know, of my background, but there were no attempts at that. Uh, and I worked very closely with our teams and everything in terms of dealing with them. Um, you know, I remember one time, uh, Judy, you know, my wife, Judy, and I hosted a chess party at our home between Americans and the Soviets. And, you know, and we dealt with them. We kept an eye on each other, let's put it that way. <laughs> Who won the chess party? Was it the Americans or the Soviets? I think they would. I see if I remember correctly. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. That's what I would have expected. Let uh, the record show that I don't recall, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Mexico, and then afterwards you have stints in the State Department and the National Security Council. Right, um, right. I, after I finished um, my tour in Mexico City, I came back to the State Department and worked in what is known as the Operations Center. That's the main communications hub in the department where all traffic comes in from around the world and from which all traffic is sent out to all our posts around the world. And our duties involve uh, keeping track of the incoming traffic and highlighting which one were 
which one should go to what principal at the department, and which one had precedence over others, as well as doing a digest of intelligence matters for the Secretary of State. We produced the intelligence um, briefing for the Secretary each day. So that was basically the tour that I had at that time. And at the, Nas- and at the NSC, the National Security Council? Were you oh, on, well, in, the, in, the, in the Soviet desk in that area or elsewhere? No, no, it's, uh, let, let me, let me uh, tell you exactly what happened, and then I'll give you some context, Alexander. Um, th- what happened is I was doing this uh, op center, operation center work at state, and they had occasion to have uh, people work in the situation room, which was the equivalent in the White House of the op center, and I got recruited, to uh, make a long story short, to work there. So I went there to do similar stuff uh, in the in the uh, operations center, obviously working for the NSC and the president and all the senior adv- presidential advisors. Uh, from from there, uh, I moved into the uh, White House press office uh, and wound up staying there almost uh, two two tours. Tour, well, I stayed there for the second Reagan administration, basically short of a month or two, and then for Bush 41, his term of office before I went out to Kiev. And here I just want to give you some context. My career in the Foreign Service spent about 20 years, but you have to understand there are two types of career paths, so to speak, in the Foreign Service. There are those that spend most of their time overseas in various posts, and those, there are those that wind up staying in Washington in policy areas and other positions. I, I wound up becoming one of the latter ones, you know, after serving in Mexico and then working at state and ops and the White House Situation Room, I wound up spending almost over seven years, I'd say, at the White House, then going out to Kiev, which basically brought me almost to the end of my career, if you add up all the years and everything. Um, and so I had a the second track in terms of uh, foreign service experience. Well, here's here's the thing that that's absolutely fascinating for me. So from from 1986 until 1992, uh, you're the deputy press secretary as well as the deputy assistant to the president in both the Reagan and Bush mm-hmm. administrations. So you are you are within the well, if not within the innermost circle, then certainly within range of the innermost circle of policymaking in the United States. And this, of course, is the period of perestroika. This is when Gorbachev comes to power. This is where the Ukrainian national movement asserts itself with a vengeance. And of course, when all the dissidents are released and start playing active roles. And of course, this is also the period when at least initially, much of U.S. policy was somewhat hesitant, to put it mildly, about the national liberation struggles of the various non-Russian peoples within the Soviet Union, and of course, the Ukrainian one in particular. And obviously, I'm referring to what eventually came to be known as the Chicken Kiev speech. Anyway, there you are, present in the, you know, the middle of the, of the policymaking arena within Washington, at probably one of the most exciting periods in the 20th century. Were you privy to the ongoing policy debates? Uh, did you, were, were you able to follow the ebb and flow of the various opinions regarding the Soviet Union, Gorbachev, the likelihood that perestroika would or would not succeed, the attitudes that the American administration had towards Ukraine, as well as some of the other non-Russian states? Uh, it's a very good question, and a lot of sub-questions in there, Alexander. Let me just give some context to our listeners. Um, toward the end of the Reagan administration, I became a deputy assistant to the president. At the level of deputy assistant, you're a senior staff member of the White House. You're kind of the upper circle of policymakers and advisors to the president. And I held that role during the Bush 41 administration. In that context, I did have the opportunity to be very close with the president in terms of traveling, everything from Air Force One, Marine One, to Camp David, as well as overseas and domestically, et cetera. So, um, and I worked very closely with Colin Powell when he was the National Security Advisor, and then with Brent Scowcroft when he was, uh, Colin Powell obviously under President Reagan, and Brent Scowcroft when he was uh, National Security Advisor under President uh, Bush. Uh, yes, and obviously Ukraine was very much in the upper minds of everyone, 
during the Reagan administration, there was obviously the movement toward the perestroika, uh, glasnost, and it was obvious that things were kind of unfolding in a, so to speak, positive way for the West, uh, so to speak. And uh, this accelerated, obviously, under the Bush 41 administration. So, uh, to, you know, uh, to answer your question, then we could dig a little bit deeper into this. Uh, I think we have to jump to the uh, Bush 41 administration. Uh, it was obvious, uh, Alexander, that uh, during the course of the latter years of that administration, that uh, the Soviet Union was not what it used to be, that things were changing. And uh, we were looking at it very, very closely. And uh, I would say that at that stage of the game, we had a twofold policy, uh, basically one of dealing with the center, namely Moscow, and the other one dealing with the republics, each of the individual republics. And it was the, uh, our intention to let the republics work out their relationship with the center and, and for us to kind of see which way it was going to go. It wasn't a question that we were hands-off. We were very careful in the sense that you're dealing with a superpower with nuclear weapons, and at the same time, people have to realize that in the context of all this, we're also dealing with a lot of other issues around the world, such as the Gulf War, Cuba, Nicaragua, apartheid in South Africa, and many of which needed uh, support or at least kind of acquiescence from uh, from the Gorbachev, uh, you know, admin, uh, you know, from Gorbachev or from the Soviet Union, for us to get uh, done, and uh, we also, in the context of Europe, kind of falling apart. I mean, Eastern Europe falling apart also had uppermost in our minds the unification of Germany and keeping, uh, you know, Germany within NATO. You know, how how East Germany and everything would be reintegrated if we ever got to that stage. So we had. We had a lot of things going, but the two main things were how do you balance the Soviet Union slowly teetering with our national interests in all these other areas that I mentioned, and at the same time, how do you balance uh, the center vis the republics uh, without making it look like you stick, as President Bush would like to would say, sticking your finger in Gorbachev's eye and unbalancing the whole thing. And so we were riding these many horses all toward one direction. But to the heart of your question, Alexander, and forgive me if I'm going on a little too long here, we realized, in specifically on Ukraine, that things were moving in that direction. And I remember talking with people on the NSC that the bottom line is it was just a matter of time you know, mm. that Ukraine would move in its uh, toward independence. And so we we all felt that. It, in our observations, we all felt that in terms of the policy, it was just a question of time. Let me jump Better. Yes, thank you very much. That was great. Um, so the Soviet Union falls apart, Ukraine becomes independent. Did you think you were going to be ambassador, that you were in the running, or was that a shock surprise to you? Uh, that was kind of Neither one, I'd say, let me, let me, that's a very interesting, very nice question, a very good question. Let me tell you how that uh, all basically came about. It wasn't in my mind or anything like that, but uh, if you remember, after Ukrainian independence was declared and uh, Kravchuk became the acting president of Ukraine, he, he visited uh, U, uh, the United States in September of 1991, and he had meetings with the president and all. And I remember that I was in the Roosevelt room. That's the room right off the outside of the Oval Office waiting for Kravchuk to go in to see the president. And I was there with Kravchuk and with uh, Larry Eagleburger, who was Deputy Secretary of State, uh, as you may recall. And Kravchuk and I were speaking, and we were conversing in Ukraine. And, of course, Larry didn't understand what we were talking about, but Kravchuk and I were talking about uh, the Ukrainian-American community in the United States, how large it is, and et cetera, active, things like that, just chit-chatting and stuff. And uh, Larry Eagleburger, if you recall, uh, Alexander, uh, used to walk with a cane at times, and he, he was listening, and then he hit me with the cane playfully, you know, and he turned to me and he said, I know where I'm sending you. So uh, <laughs> I say that, I tell you that story because this is September of 91. So we already were knowing which direction Ukraine was going, and Larry had in mind who, who he was going to be sending to Kiev. Uh, and so, you know, and Ukraine didn't declare 
uh, formally, you know, well, they had the referendum in December of 91, as, as you recall, mm-hmm. and we recognized Ukraine on Christmas Day of, uh, of, that, of that year. So, but, uh, you know, two, three or four months before all that transpired, I, I tell this story because it answers your specific question about the ambassadorship, but it also indicates that this was something that uh, Ukrainian independence was something that we all were, you know, understood was taking place. And obviously this was a month or so after the declaration and everything in, in August, the previous month. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm going to ask you in a second, you know, how you would compare Ukraine today with Ukraine, with the Ukraine that you saw when you became ambassador and arrived in Kiev. Uh, but in order to do that, let me first ask you the following question, namely, when you arrived in Kiev, uh, were you shocked? Were you surprised by goings on? Uh, I assume this was your first time to Ukraine? No, no, my first time to Ukraine was uh, with President Bush when we came. Oh, of course. uh, The the famous, as you call it, the Chicken Kiev speech. Uh, So I had been to Kiev uh, during that time and had seen uh, Kiev and had seen uh, the populace and had seen how things were uh, going on and everything. And it was quite obvious during that visit um, uh, that uh, Ukraine and the Soviet Union was falling apart in terms of how the people acted. I mean, there were soldiers walking around and selling their hats, so you know the place was falling apart. That's right. That's always a good sign. When soldiers sell hats, you know you're in trouble. Uh, but what, what was, I mean, you, you, were you daunted by the prospect of having to set up an embassy, get a staff, establish relations with a barely existent Ukrainian foreign ministry, establish relations with Karabchuk, whom you had met? I suppose that was to, all to the good. What was that like? Well, uh, first of all, I had met a lot of the Ukrainian uh, leadership, uh, particularly parliamentarians beforehand, because a lot of them had started coming to the States already uh, before I arrived in Kiev. Uh, So I had met uh, many of them uh, in Washington when they had come. But uh, you're absolutely right. One of the challenges we faced was not only the policy side, but also the administrative side in terms of creating the structure. But I always felt that Ukraine would be an extremely important uh, country for us now in terms of our policy in the region. So I pushed very hard to get as many agencies of the U.S. government represented there. And quite frankly, I had a lot of support from uh, friends at the State Department uh, that have kind of paved the way for me to uh, to uh, get uh, all kinds of representation. So there was a lot of interest in Ukraine uh, also from the various agencies, and that was helpful so we wound up having representatives from a lot of various agencies, uh, and we started getting a lot of staff right off the right off the bat. I think, Alexander, I don't hold me to this number, but I think originally it was like 15 or 16 people. By the time by the time I left, it was well beyond that, and then we had a great number of foreign nationals, meaning Ukrainian nationals, who were working for us. So we started augmenting uh, the staff uh, very very quickly. Uh, because we saw this would be a very important country for us in um, in the in the future, so uh, we started putting some resources into it. Maybe not as many as I would have liked to write off the off the bat. I think one of the drawbacks to Ukraine, but also to the other posts, the new posts that uh, evolved, uh, new countries that evolved out of the fall part of the Soviet Union, was that we didn't go for a separate uh, appropriations. We kind of cobbled everything together out of the existing State Department budget by taking money from one uh, bureau or one area and putting it into, you know, these new posts. So we were kind of limited in that respect. But we eventually caught up in Ukraine, as you can see now, is very large is a very large post uh, for us. Uh, just one more question before I ask you to jump ahead 30 years. Um, What was your impression of your Ukrainian counterparts, of the diplomats, the foreign minister, Mr. Pavlichko, the president, Kravchuk? Were you impressed by their professionalism? Were you distraught by their lack of professionalism? Um, I know this is a sensitive question, but uh, it's, it's one that I certainly encountered in my initial meetings with some of the Ukrainians in 1991 and 92. Well, you know, given the fact that they were a new uh, country and newly independent, uh, I got along very well with Zlenko, who was, uh, you know, the foreign minister at the time. Pavlichko I dealt with uh, on a regular basis, as well as uh, a lot of other former dissidents. 
uh, that were uh, playing a role in uh, in Ukrainian politics. Um, the the I found that the professionalism was fr- uh, pretty good. I, I actually have to say, Alexander, I think one of the problems that the Ukrainians had is not so much the professionalism, but the lack of enough personnel to deal with the issues. Uh, you know, when the Soviet Union fell apart, I think one of the drawbacks that uh, a lot of these country new countries had, and I know Ukraine in particular, they just didn't have the the, the necessary number of people to deal with the various issues that were facing them. But on a daily basis, in terms of responsiveness, in terms of understanding the issues, and in terms of trying to push the Ukrainian agenda, I found them. Uh, I found them. Uh, I, I found them. You know, almost on the par on the par of, of, of other governments and other professions, professional diplomats. Just they just didn't have the numbers uh, to to deal with all the issues. No, of course. Uh, Okay, let's just jump ahead 30 years. When you look at Ukraine today and you compare it to the country that you saw in 1992 when you arrived to be ambassador in Kiev, um, how would you evaluate Ukraine's progress or lack of progress over the last 30 years? Uh, What differences strike you as being most important and what lack of differences strike you as being most important? And more generally, where would you place Ukraine? Is it a thriving democracy or is it a backward, corrupt third world state, as so much of the um, media report? Well, I'll be honest with you. I think it's neither a thriving democracy nor is it a backward state. It's in the middle. It's still a developing state, but it's a democracy, I would say. I would say there are a number of things. That sh- first of all, when I first arrived in Cave, I was struck by the talent of the, of the people and the de- dedication of the people and uh, the desire of the people, you know, to try to move forward. And I traveled the country. Um, I was even to Crimea during my stay, and I traveled north, south, east, and west, and I was impressed by the desire of the people to move forward. Uh, I think that's in many many ways it continues to this day. I've traveled a number of times to Ukraine subsequent to my tour there. I think I was last there about two years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I would say there are a number of things that have developed over the course of years, which kind of will answer your question of 30 years ago and also your question as to the present. I I would say uh, there were three things that impressed me about Ukraine. And to pick up on your words on democracy, Ukraine has moved forward on the democratic path. uh, People don't give Ukraine enough credit in terms of the development of democracy and the development of their civic society. If you look at Ukraine, uh, they've had a number of presidential elections, all of which, you know, some of them were obviously marred. You remember the Orange Revolution and uh, the Yanukovych issues and stuff like that. Uh, Some of them marred by, you know, a a lot of corruption. But the the system righted itself, and there were peaceful transfers of power. Uh, You as a social scientist know well, I think think the common number is like three or four successful elections indicates that a grounding in democracy is taking place in a society. So I don't think Ukraine is given enough credit for its development of uh, democratic institutions and the spread of civic society, which is quite strong and growing in Ukraine, the NGO community and uh, uh, other organizations that have been developing in Ukraine. The other thing that I would give Ukraine credit for is the ethnic issue. Um, During the time I came to Kiev when I was there originally, there was a lot of talk and fear that Ukraine would fall apart along ethnic lines, the divisions, you know, Ukrainians versus Russians, and vice versa. And none of that transpired at all. Uh, sure, they have their own ethnic issues, uh, you know, with Hungary and possibly in Romania and other issues that uh, evolve, but they've been able to deal with them in a manner that uh, is consistent with their processes and their institutions. And um, none of the... Uh, uh, you know, big upheavals have taken place. And it wasn't until uh, Putin introduced his little green men in Crimea and, and then his f- f- formal forces in eastern Ukraine and supported the separatists and uh, marched into Crimea, as I mentioned, that uh, the ethnic issue came to the fore. In other words, it was really manufactured from the outside. 
basically what I'm trying to say is left to its own devices, Ukraine was able to deal with ethnic diversity very well for the 30, you know, well, not 30, for 25 or, you know, 23 years until the Russians really stuck their finger in the situation. And I don't think a lot of people have given Ukraine enough credit for that, particularly when you look in the early years and there was this fear that Ukraine would fall apart along ethnic lines. The other thing I, I would give Ukraine a lot of credit for is uh, something that I noticed that they wanted to become westernized when I was there, and they really moved the process very formally. Now, I know we like to look at two things, NATO membership and EU membership, neither of which have taken place fully for Ukraine, obviously. But Ukraine is very much integrated into the NATO structures in a, in a, with the various organizations, as well as into the EU with the with the trade act, the trade agreement, et cetera, and other agreements that they have. And that's very important. And uh, another thing, and that is important because it's not only moving Ukraine toward Western Europe, but it's also moving Ukraine away from Russia and the Russian narrative. Uh, right now, most of Ukraine's trade is with the EU, I think like 40% of its trades with them. And, you know, over the last two years or so, Ukraine's trade, single biggest trading partner country is China now, not Russia. So Ukraine has moved very steadily into the Western sphere, even though it hasn't formally become a member of NATO or of the EU as such, but it's moved. So I'd say those are the three things that are successes for Ukraine. So I would say, yes, you know, picking up on your concept of corruption, does corruption exist? Sure. Does uh, is, do they need reform? Sure, they need judicial reform and legal reform. But it's a it's a, it's a work in progress, and I see the progress is moving forward. And in a nutshell, comparing Ukraine today to 30 years ago, night and day, it's it's a. I tell you, uh, uh, Alexander, as you know, when I first arrived in Kiev back in June of '92, there was practically nothing in terms of the stores, the lifestyle. Now you arrive in cave, you think you're in Paris, you're on Fifth Avenue, the storefronts, the nightlife, the restaurants, et cetera, a big sea change. Now, obviously, the salon, you know, the villages haven't changed that much, but this, the country is moving forward, and it's, and it's moving west uh, uh, every year. I hope that answered your question. No, it's a very good answer. Thank you. And, and you know, so even the villages have changed. I was recently... On a, uh, having a teaching a course for the Ukrainian Free University, and one of the students, a young woman, uh, was on Zoom on the internet. I asked her where she was Zooming from, and it turned out to be a tiny village some 70 kilometers north of Lviv. This would have been impossible a number of years ago, but here she was connected to me, who was in New York, teaching a course via the internet that's based in a university in Munich. Uh, so things do change. Uh, sure. We have a question here, by the way, that ties in specifically to the comment you made about ethnic diversity and the treatment of minority groups. And the question is as follows. Besides geography and citizenship, what is the one thing in your view that makes this very diverse demographic population, quote unquote, Ukrainian? I think the... There's an identity. Well, geography uh, obviously is part of it. You know, Ukrainians identify Ukrainianism based on geography, not on ethnicity. You know, if you're Jewish, Polish, German, Russian background, if you live in Ukraine, you're a Ukrainian. That's that's the key. I think the the one thing that ties everybody together is a sense of common destiny. And I'll go back to December of 1991, as you recall, and that um, independence referendum. Over 90% of Ukrainians voted for independence, and that included, by the way, a majority of the people who lived in, in Crimea, and Crimea was the only area in Ukraine that had a majority Russian population. So that shows you that even the Russian minority was very favorable toward a common destiny. I think the sense that struck me when I traveled there in, in during the years when I served and in subsequent years is the sense of common destiny that they can they can't build a better future given the history of Ukraine in terms of its resources, the concept of being the breadbasket of Europe, uh, the industrial base they inherited from the old Soviet Union and that they've developed on their own, and the, and the fact that they all seem to want to move west, uh, you know, excluding obviously older generations, but the youth and everything. I think that is a common feature the sense of destiny and the sense of unity and moving in a common direction is, 
I think, uh, unifies the country to a great extent. I think you're right. I share your opinion on that very much so. Um, okay, we, are, we have about 10 more minutes. I've got two more questions, and then we'll open it up more generally to the public if there are any questions. So those of you listening, if you do have questions, please post them on the chat, and I will get to them uh, well as soon as possible. Um, imagine for the sake of argument, Mr. Ambassador, that you have a private audience with President Zelensky. And he's asking you for advice on the occupied Donbass, Crimea. He's asking you for advice on Russia. And he's asking you for advice on relations with the United States. What would you tell him on those three separate issues? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a tall question. I know. Uh, <laughs> let, let me take we we make that. you sing for your supper. <laughs> I see that. I see that. First of all, Alexander, stop. To, uh, drop the ambassador. Just call me Roman. It'll be a lot easier. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, well, on the Russia issue, I would say you know that he's got to be careful and continue uh, separating Ukraine from Russia, so that the narrative isn't one that no Russia always writes. And uh, I think I'd point to my early answer in terms of uh, Ukraine mo moving toward the EU and NATO, et cetera. So I, I would. Uh, make sure that he understood that. And I, I think President Zelensky uh, uh, understands that uh, very, very well. In terms of the uh, Donbass issue, uh, I would say that um, a, right now, uh, the, all the questions, the questions that you answer all are kind of tied in. Uh, on Donbass and on Crimea, you have to put Crimea in there, the chances of getting a solution in the short term are very, very minimal, I think, at this stage of the game. I think what he needs to do is to make sure that Ukraine continues moving toward the West, that uh, the impediments of Russia holding Donbass and Crimea is not a block toward integration to the EU, and this is where the United States is going to be important, where President Zelensky should work with the United States to make sure the United States supports uh, Ukraine fully moving toward EU integration, irrespective of, you know, the frozen conflicts in those areas. So the main thing is to keep the separation from Russia, to keep the United States in line to support Ukraine's movement toward the West, and that the uh, United States should continue giving uh, good military support to Ukraine, including lethal defensive weapons, uh, because it's important for the Russians to understand that in the event they should think of taking on a further aggression against Ukraine, while Ukraine may not win a conflict, they would inflict heavy damages on Russia that the Russians, for internal Russian purposes, would not be able to bear. In other words, the cost of any incursion would be too high for Putin to bear. And that's important to signal that to the Russians. So for the U.S., uh, we have to support uh, Ukraine moving toward the EU. We have to support Ukraine in terms of its military needs, and, Zel and President Zelensky has to be patient with the frozen conflict at this stage of the game and uh, not to give in to the Russians in terms of their of the Minsk process and uh, keep keep steady in terms of demanding, you know, the Russian withdrawal of forces. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, just keep moving, moving toward the West because all those three issues, the U.S., Donbass, and Russia are all tied in. And I think as Ukraine moves toward the West, a lot of that can be resolved. And in the long term, I'm an optimist, Alexander. I'm a diplomat, so I'm an optimist. I think Ukraine, as it develops, as it becomes more uh, economically viable, and I'm a very uh, firm believer it will do so. It's got great resources and greatly talented people. That will become a magnet back to Crimea and Donbass. And at the same time, you know, the Putin years will eventually end and Russia uh, can't continue the way it is. There will be changes in Russia. The combination of Ukraine's success and changes in Russia, I think, would uh, create an atmosphere that will be more conducive to getting the Donbass and Crimea settled on Ukrainian, uh, on Ukrainian rules. So you, you, just pre you just preempted my final question. Uh, I was going to ask you to look into a crystal ball and tell me where you think Ukraine and Russia will be, you know, roughly 10 years from now. And you seem to be quite bullish. In other words, Ukraine will be around, presumably dynamic, presumably doing relatively well or possibly very well. And Putin, you know, God willing, will be gone. 
Well, you know, eventually he will be gone in one way or the other. He will be gone. I think the society is going to change. You have to realize, you know, as Ukraine strengthens itself, it will become a magnet to the Russians. You know, I just can see the people in, in Russia saying, well, what is this? These Ukrainians have been able to develop. They're moving toward the West. They've got all kinds of economic progress, all kinds of consumer goods. And we're stuck as a gas station here in, uh, in uh, you know, Central Asia. There's something wrong with our system, and they'll start questioning that. I, I have no doubt about that, and I think that's one of the reasons Putin and his, and his uh, you know, uh, leaders, his leadership and the people around him are so adamant about stifling uh, Ukraine. It's not only because of the historical thing as they see, but at the same time uh, they see Ukraine as a threat to their rule, their authoritarian rule. Uh, in uh, Russia, and therefore they've been trying to stifle Ukraine. For, as that's one of the reasons they've been trying to stifle it. So yes, I'm a firm believer, and I'm very bullish on Ukraine in the future. I've always been very bullish on Ukraine, and you know it's it's moved 30 years. If you look at Ukraine, look Alexander, you know the history of Ukraine as well as I do. Uh, Ukraine has never had a period of independence as long as these 30 years, and nobody ever gave it uh, credit that it would last this long. I remember when I was ambassador serving and, you know, in, uh, in uh, Kiev, there were people that were talking, had this, like a bowl of jelly, five years in Ukraine will fall apart and everything will back, go back. It was kind of like the 1917 revolution, people were saying. And here we are 30 years later, and, we're, and Ukraine is doing very well. So uh, I'm very bullish on Ukraine. I share your optimism and I hail it. <laughs> it's something that Ukrainians, it seems to me, both here uh, but especially in Ukraine, really, really need to cultivate. I mean, their country really isn't doing all that badly. As a matter of fact, one could even say it's doing quite well. And if, if nothing else, that's the image, that's the attitude that Ukrainians need to project to the outside world. I mean, because if Ukrainians don't believe in themselves, why should anybody else? Yeah, I think the Ukrainians have had a hard time branding themselves. Quite frankly, they've always been kind of reactive and a lot of this is due to the disinformation from the Russian side. But I think the uh, Ukrainians need to become a little bit more adept in terms of branding themselves. And that's unfortunate uh, because a lot of it is painted by the old Russian narrative. And this is why it's important. You know, uh, if you, if you uh, look at the history of the relationship between Ukraine and, and Russia, Everyone in the West kind of accepts the Russian narrative of what Ukraine is, uh, kind of a subsection or a, of Russia, you know, a little Russia, as the old saying used to be. And that's, that kind of mindset still kind of continues. And Ukraine has to do a, a better job in terms of selling itself as, a, as an independent country, as an independent culture, as an independent entity, separate from that. And I think, I think it's slowly starting to move out from under that Russian narrative. And this is what's frightening to Putin even, uh, even now, because I think he's starting to see Ukraine slipping away that way. If you, if you, if you peel the onion on Ukrainian politics, yes, you know, taking your words from before, this corruption, et cetera. But the, the steps that Ukraine has undertaken over the past 30 years toward integrating with the West, and building this its own site. No one would have expected this 30 years ago, I don't think. Everyone, you know, a lot of the observers were looking upon Ukraine as possibly a failed state. It's not, it's not going to be a failed state. It will survive. I think it's going to do very well. And this goes to something I think you alluded to earlier, picking up on what I was saying. The young generation, you know, I've, I've spent time with students in Kharkiv, for example. They speak Ukrainian, they speak Russian, they speak English. They have a sense of identity, identity that they're Ukrainian. They don't see themselves as Russian or Ukrainian or, you know, anything or whatever. They, they see themselves as having common destiny on a common, uh, on a common territory. They're Ukrainian and they're moving forward. And that's going to be the strength. The young generation is the strength. One more generation, I think Ukraine is going to be much further ahead than it is even now. Okay, I agree, by the way. So we've got three questions. I'd like to get to them. We have one from Mr. Myron Melnick. He asks, how can we derail Nord Stream 2, or is it too late? Oh, it's way too late. I think it's 98% completed. It's ready to rock and roll, so to use an old cliche. Uh, and uh, you saw the, uh, 
uh, our, you know, our the Biden administration has been supportive of that because of the German interest in uh, Nord Stream. Germany has a heavy stake in Nord Stream, but both in terms of uh, financing, I guess, of it, uh, but more uh, more importantly because of the oil flow that would come. So trying to derail uh, Nord Stream 2 is probably too late. I think the next best step is the agreement that uh, the United States and Germany have is that in the event Russia uses uh, uh, energy as a tool against Europe or Ukraine, that there will be some kind of punishment uh, of, against Russia. The proof is in the pudding, though, because it goes undefined what kind of punishments will be uh, exacted against the Russians if they should do that. But that's the best we could do right now. I think, North, North, like I said, Nord Stream 2 is, I think, 98% completed, so it's there's not much you can do at this stage of the game, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from the president of the Institute, Kathy Nellewaiko. Who are the most important but not very obvious allies who support Ukraine should cultivate? Well, first of all, Kathy, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I appreciate that. I didn't have the chance to thank you at, up front. Who are the most important allies that, uh, that Ukraine should cultivate? But, the, oh. but not very obvious allies. <laughs> oh, not for you. I think they're all going to be pretty obvious. Uh, I think uh, I think Ukraine's best hope is uh, European allies. Germany would be a good one. They really have to cultivate. Uh, obviously, the in, uh, the United States and Canada, because of the diaspora, they have to be. Uh, they have to cultivate those. Uh, so you know, I'd say Germany. Uh, France, and obviously because of their role in the uh, Minsk process, but uh, Canada, the United States. Uh, I would answer uh, Kathy's question in, in this way, though. I'd be very careful about others that they are cultivating now. And here I speak about the Chinese, for example. The Chinese have a very active role, both, you know, economically, particularly in Ukraine, and they're trying to increase that role. Uh, I, I would be very careful about overextending that relationship with China, because it could only harm the relationship with the Western countries. I know we, me in the United States, are a little concerned about any inroads that uh, the Chinese might make in the aerospace sector uh, or, you know, the military sector in Ukraine. So the Ukrainians have to be careful about that. But I would keep doing what the Ukrainians are doing right now, uh, concentrate on Europe, and um, you know, particularly the United States uh, uh, and Canada also. And I think that's the best avenue for them at this time. Uh, let me just add, uh, and how, what, what are your feelings about Turkey? Well, Turkey's fine. I mean, uh, you know, the Black Sea region, uh, they, it goes without saying that, you know, Ukraine borders seven countries, including Russia. The Outside of Russia, the other six countries, uh, you know, uh, in Belarus, it might be difficult, but, you know, Poland will be very, very important if uh, we're talking about the, the immediate neighborhood, Romania, Hungary, you know, Slovakia, you know, or in Turkey, across the ocean, and all, you know, of course, the Black Sea. Those would be very important. Uh, it might, you know, Ukraine could actually be an anchor in that region, uh, tying all those countries together in some kind of economic union. Uh, you know, Ukraine is very gifted in terms of its geographic setting. Throughout the ages, it's been the crossroads of empires, which made Ukraine suffer. But right now, it's the crossroads for trade between Asia and Europe. And so it could really tie the Black Sea region together. So Turkey will be a key component in that kind of strategy. There's another question that just appeared um, by Maria Mikolenko, and she asked, well, what about relations with Poland? Also, what about relations with the Southern Asian former Soviet, well, I, I assume the Central Asian republics, the former Soviet republics in Central Asia? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, the, all these questions are tied together. When Kathy asked the question, I was looking for a field in terms of leverage. Poland is, key, is a key ally because Poland is a member of NATO, and Poland shares the same kind of uh, history with the Russia that Ukrainians basically share. So it would be good to have you Poland as an ally in that respect. But overall, I think what Ukraine needs is the leverage of the powers like Germany, who have a huge economic power, as well as you know the military and economic power of countries like uh, the United States uh, to leverage it. Because right now, 
the greatest threat to Ukraine is Russia, and you need leverage against uh, Russia. And Poland is a good ally, but it can't leverage, uh, you know, it can't give you the same leverage that a good relationship with Germany, France, and the United States can give you. Uh, in terms of the Stan, so to speak, Turkestan, Turkmenistan, um, you know, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, I know that uh, they've been, a, uh, Turk, I guess it's Turkmenistan's been a source of gas, or is it Tajikistan? I keep getting it. Turkmenistan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, as a source of gas. So if we trade, it's good, but they're, they're not going to be as important in terms of leveraging against uh, Russia. I keep looking, uh, Alexander, I keep thinking about this in terms of the grand, grander uh, you know, geopolitical situation, what Ukraine needs to do in order to maintain its independence and its own security, and that's going to come from countries like the United States and Germany. Uh, let me just be a devil's advocate here for a second before I go to the final question. Um, and, you know, the U.S. is on board. I mean, sometimes it's enthusiastically on board. Sometimes it's a little tired. But nevertheless, it seems to be on board. Uh, how do you get the Germans on board? I mean, here they go, sign a gas deal with the Russians. Uh, when they refer to World War II, they refer to it as the Russia War. Uh, they're not fully appreciative of the fact that when they invaded the Soviet Union, they were actually invading Ukraine, first and foremost. Uh, yeah. How do you get them on board? That's a very, very good question. It's a very difficult question. Uh, right now, you know, Ger Germany is uh, colored by two things. Number one, the history of the Russian uh, wars uh, that the Germans have had, World War II, and the invasions and the political and military threat that Russia is to Europe. That obviously co colors the German leadership's view. And the second thing is what we talked about earlier is uh, the energy issue. Uh, Germany needs the energy from Russia, uh, not only for consumer goods, but for its own industrial base. Those are two issues that are very, very key. The, uh, the way to get this done is to uh, only time will take will heal the former in terms of the German perspective of Russia as a political threat. I think the best way to do this, and I've always told this to the Ukrainians, is you can't really look to security uh, outside. You can have some security. The you United know, States gives support, and et cetera. But the best road to security is to build up your own society, become a viable economic power on your own right. Once you become that, then you kind of attenuate any Russian threat. I think that in itself, if Ukraine were to build itself as a strong, uh, viable economic entity, and now it's building a military to run parallel to that, I think countries like Germany and France will see that their eggs do not necessarily have to be in the Russian basket, that there is a counterpoint in the region. So a lot of this is basically falls on the Ukrainian side. You can't look to the Germans to uh, change policy when Ukraine is still kind of, as they see it, floundering in terms of its own uh, reforms and, thing, and uh, development. So I think Ukraine is going to take a few years for Ukraine to strengthen itself economically. Its military is getting strengthened. Once Ukraine has those two uh, footings set, the economy and its military strength, I think there will be a lot of changes in terms of perspective uh, from a lot of West European states uh, as to what Russia uh, is in terms of a threat, because you will have a strong Ukraine that it kind of serves as a buffer, as a counterpoint, uh, whatever you know, word you want to use in that respect. So a lot of this basically are then the falls on, on, the, on the Ukrainian shoulders. Um, gosh, you know, I, I find myself agreeing with you all the time. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if that's if that's good for you, but but in any case, I certainly agree. Okay, uh, I think we're coming to the conclusion, and there's a question that is very appropriate because it kind of wraps things up and kind you know t takes us back to you and your career. This is from Andrew Horodisky, and he asked the following three questions: Are there any projects, recent or not, that you are most proud of? Then, do you have plans for writing a memoir? And finally, what legacy do you want to leave? Well, let me take the last one first. Uh, I don't, uh, first of all, thank you for all the questions. 
in terms of legacies, I'll let history judge that. You know, I, I did the best I could in terms of serving my time in Ukraine and dealing in Ukrainian relationships and working in the Reagan and Bush administrations. So I'll let history you know, judge that uh, in itself. In terms of memoirs, I, I've, I've written a few articles here and there that touch upon my experiences, and I'm actually trying to work on one for the Ukrainian quarter uh, for this fall. Uh, Ehud Laboha and I have been speaking about that. And so I, I, to answer that part of the questions, uh, it kind of comes out in drips and drafts, but I don't have any plans right now to write one single you know, book about uh, memoirs or anything of, uh, of that nature. Uh, in terms of projects, I'm not sure I understand. You, you're talking specifically about Ukraine projects. Well, it, Mr. Herdisky simply says, are there any projects that you are most proud of? I suppose uh, things that you perhaps have done or accomplished. Maybe that's the way to interpret the question. What are you most proud of in terms of your own career and, and of your own achievements? Well, you know, it's, it's, uh, I wouldn't say proud or achievements. I, I think uh, if we take it to Ukraine, and this takes me back 30 years ago, I think one of the things that I worked hard on, and I, I think this kind of fits into that third question about legacy, I'll let, let history judge it, but I think one of the things that we, and I mean by we, I mean everyone at the embassy could be very proud of, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, so I'll just share this with you, is when I arrived in Kiev back in 92, uh, visas were still being issued out of Moscow, so people basically had to travel to Moscow to get a visa you know, from Ukraine to go to the States. And we had a kind of a long-term plan, like well over a year, to change the system. Well, I arrived in June, and by August we were issuing visas out of Kiev. I uh, had a very good consul staff. We just took the bull by the horns, changed everything, and got the department uh, uh, reoriented. And this was, I thought, it was very important because it showcased to the Ukrainians that we respected them and we expected them to deal directly with the United States and not have to go to Moscow. So that was one uh, one achievement I think that everyone at the embassy could be very proud of, you know. Uh, and uh, but that, you know, I'm going to leave it uh, to uh, history. I, I'm going to punt on this one again. I'll leave it <laughs> to history, make the judgment. You know, uh, I, I, you know, Alexander to say, you know, you get a job, you do the job, and you let others judge whether you did it right or wrong. And you, you know, you do the best you can. So. We'll just leave it at that. But I appreciate the question. I, I understand that, but it's kind of hard to. Uh, I, I usually don't do introspectives as to say what was good, bad, or ugly to you. So, so <laughs> <ugly>. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Let me conclude by mm -hmm. reading a, a brief statement from uh, Ms. Christina Polanski. I think this, uh, you know, it's an appropriate way to end this evening. Thank you, Ambassador Popoduk, for being bullish about Ukraine. We need many more like you, especially in Ukraine. Your attitude is contagious and worth spreading all around. Um, on that happy note, let me thank you as well. I found this to be extremely enlightening and uh, very, very interesting. And thank you for your candor. Thank you for your openness and your honesty. Um, and I wish you all the best, and maybe perhaps I can pass the baton back to Kathy Nalivaiko. Thank you okay, again, thank Roman Popadiuk, ambassador to Ukraine in 1992-93. Not a problem. Thank you very much, Alexander. I enjoyed myself. Sorry we couldn't do it technically to have it as a Zoom call. Sorry about that. Hello? Thank you. Thank yes, you. Sir. Uh, thank you. Kathy, the floor is yours, but you're you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. Oh, you can't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, uh, okay. perhaps I, 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 I let me speak on behalf of the institute um, and thank all the participants. Uh, there were over forty, so thank you all for coming in on a Friday evening. And I see Kathy Nelavico is back. Yeah, suddenly for the first time I had to hit Alt A to unmute myself. So that's a new one for me. I do Zooms all day long. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Roman, thank you very much. Um, Alex, thank you very much to everybody in our audience for your thoughtful questions and for your engagement. Thank you for continuing to support the Ukrainian Institute's programs. 
Um, we hope to see you again sometime very soon. Uh, and uh, otherwise, uh, good night and stay well and be safe and healthy. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Take care. Take good care, night. everyone. Okay, good thank night. you very Bye. much. Good Bye. Night. Take care. Bye.